Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Elizabeth Lesser and she is talking about her book, Cassandra Speaks, When Women Are the Storytellers. So welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, so I wanted to start off with um, the purpose and design of women and what um, we've been told according to all the different stories we've been told by men about our purpose and design of women. Um, so I wanted to start off there in terms of like what we have conditioned ourselves perhaps in believing. Yeah, well, that sort of was the genesis of writing this book. Um, women and culture are changing so much now around women, women in leadership, women in power, what's our role, the home, the child raising. And I took a deep dive and looked back at the old stories that have told us who women are, what our design and purpose are for. And I really questioned, what are these stories? Whether it's Adam and Eve or Cassandra, the title of the book or Pandora or lots of characters in literature, ancient all the way to modern. Who wrote those stories? Why did they write them? And what have they taught everyone, men and women, over the years about what is our purpose? What is our nature? What is our design? And, you know, I took the attitude, and some of your listeners may not agree with me, but that even stories in the Bible, well, they were made up by people. They were made up by ancient nomadic tribes trying to describe what life was all about. And so I unpack in the book, the story of Eve and what it's told us about women and men and what we still believe, whether we're religious or not, this, those old stories, they stick to us. They outlive whole civilizations, mm. you know? The story of Adam and Eve, let's just say, for example, and I unpack a lot of them in the book, that story has outlived so many uh, governments and cultures. It's still our foundational story. And um, it, it, it sticks to women and men in telling us who we are, why we were born and designed and what our roles are. And I question that story. And I talk about in the book, what if Eve had told that story? How would she have told it differently? Mm. And what do you think are our roles? What do you think that story tells us about our role? Who wrote it? What are our roles and what they told us about well, who we should be? Let's do a little quick uh, cliff note of the story. Mm -hmm. We all know it, but I'll just tell it again the way it's told to us that Garden of Eden was this place of perfection. There was nothing wrong with it. There was enough food. All the animals were peaceful. God was watching over it. And there was one human there, Adam, one man. We don't know for how long, but maybe thousands of years, maybe hundreds, maybe a month. We don't know. But everything was perfect. And then God noticed that Adam needed a helpmate. That's what it says in the Bible. Now, maybe God was tired of taking care of Adam, I don't know, but he, he needed to get a helpmate for Adam, and so he made Eve. So Eve was created second, and then they were told, you know, there's just one tree in the center of the garden that you shouldn't eat, because if you eat it, you will become like the gods, and you will die. And a snake who in biblical days, snakes were seen as purveyors of wisdom. The snake told Adam, uh, told Eve, eat this fruit, it'll make you wise. And she said, no, we'll die. And in my imagining, the snake said, no, that, not literally, the childlike part of you will die and you will become wise. And so Eve wants to become wise, who wouldn't? And she ate and then the fall and all sin happened and all sin is blamed on women. 
She was born second, but the first to sin. And her curiosity and her desire for empowerment and autonomy is a sin, and therefore she has been punished for that. Now, the Bible has so many stories of these um, protagonists, whether it's uh, uh, Noah or Moses or Job or Jesus. This is the story of men who want to become wise. They want to move away from the culture as it's been known and establish their own sense of self and their own sense of um, what's good for human beings. So they leave their home and they leave their, their parents and they go out into the world and they become heroes. It's the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And you must leave what's known to become yourself and to become good. Now, Eve's the only protagonist in the Bible who's punished for that same urge. Mm. Lies. She had to leave the garden. But I look at Eve as the first grown up. She was the first person in the Bible to have that urge to find the wisdom, spiritual wisdom, find her autonomy, her maturity. And she said to Adam, we have to grow up. We can't be children anymore. Um, we're we're going to grow up. But this idea that women's curiosity and desire for sense of self is a punishable act mm. has followed us through the ages. And it's still with us. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we try to have our own voice, find ourselves, become not second, but, you know, equal, it's those are the times when this story is in direct conflict of what we've been told both as men and as women in terms of who we are. And so as a role, I guess our role is to, in the story, I'm, I'm following the story as we are second, we are sinful, and um, our desire to, of, uh, of self um, finding ourselves is a punishable act, it's sinful. And so it, we should just find it, our place, be quiet. <laughs> right, be quiet. And uh, uh, this isn't to say all men are keeping women down. That, that's, that's not the point of the book at all to me. Because I think we all suffer from the same things, men and women. And um, so for, for women, to work on finding our voice. That's our job. That's mm -hmm. our job. Nobody can mm -hmm. give it to us. Mm -hmm. And nobody can free us from this story. We have mm -hmm. to free ourselves first. Mm -hmm. I am worthy to want to have my own voice. What I consider valuable in a human being, that is a valid concern. And so it's an inner journey. And um, it's a, it's a, important journey and I think it's important for women for us to find our voice now our mm -hmm. specific voice not mm -hmm. to have a voice like a man but to have our own belief in ourself belief in what we know is important um, and to find a way to say it in such a way that we're heard and believed and valued mm-hmm um, and what do you think these stories do to us in terms of how it makes us, you mentioned in the book, you know, either self-doubt or overthinking. And, and you actually, as part of um, one of the co-founders of Omega Institute, have this woman leadership program, which you had founded. And so you have many women coming in and exploring women in power. When you've been sitting through the sessions or um, what have you found is the overthinking or self-doubt that um, a lot of women share? Yeah, well, you, you may have heard the word, uh, the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, men can suffer from it, but all the research has been done that women suffer from it much more. This sense like, let's say you're in a meeting at work 
and um, this voice in your head is like, well, I don't know quite enough to speak and those people might know more than me. And, and it's sort of whatever comes out of your mouth comes out sort of like an apology, like saying like, well, I haven't totally researched the whole thing, but maybe meanwhile, a man who knows perhaps less than you do is busy mansplaining away. And um, us digging deep within and knowing what we know is enough and mm -hmm. uh, working on that sense of constantly doubting ourselves mm -hmm. is um, just as important to me as changing structures. I mean, changing structural reality is so important, but so is changing these voices that live in our head that tell us we're not smart enough, we're not trained enough, we're not good enough, and working on um, knowing our inherent worth and goodness. All right, so I have two different examples that I'll bring that come to mind. Um, I um, work as a coach and, and not surprisingly, a lot of the people who um, are coming to me recently have been women, um, particularly women who are in um, high level positions in leadership and um, some of which are in the tech community of which I used to be part of. And I either see, I see these two extremes that are being played out in meeting rooms. Um, there's either, um, and I understand the, the reasoning for both, but I don't know if I have the answer necessarily. And I don't know if we, we can even come up with an answer, but these are the two extremes. So, um, I was at Microsoft and sometimes with rooms where it was me and 39 men in a room um, from the dev teams and um, getting a word in edge wise was like very hard. So you would have to like push yourself out. It's almost like, you know, you're, I'm imagining merging onto a really busy highway and you just like put the <laughs> gas on the pedal and hope you don't crash into anyone. You know, and so there are these two approaches and because I'm from the East Coast and I was a Boston driver, there is this kind of like just put the pedal on the metal and like say what you need to say and, you know, be strong about it and like say it with authority and a sense of like um, warriorship, you know, and so I was known as kind of you're very intense, you're very intense, you scare me. Okay, so this is what happened for me in that world when I was in my 30s a long time ago. Now come along um, this woman that I'm coaching in, um, she's also in her 30s. She's working in high tech still like 30s, you know, 20 years later, she's in high tech and she's having the same kind of situation. And her approach is, well, I'm wondering whether I may be wrong, but I'm wondering, you know, and so she has a sing songy voice, always like a statement is made up as a question, you know, and, and she's now being told that's also wrong because you sound weak. So you have these two extremes and, you know, I'm, I, I often have a, um, a tension between seeing these two extremes and then hearing the research. So there is um, some research with um, how women have to behave in the workplace. And this research had found that men have gender expectations. And so when women don't follow those gender expectations and they talk as if another man would talk, um, it's not received well. However, if you talk in this kind of sing-songy, sort of way, also not accepted. And so you have to kind of know which of these two personas you're supposed to bring up at the right time. And then basically it, when it was demonstrated to me, the ideal approach, it comes into like this heartless autocrat, you know? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss to like wonder what is the right approach having yeah. experience and seen both approaches. So what, what's your thought on this? Well, first of all, you described it spot on. I don't think there's any woman who has been in any industry who's not experienced that. Now, maybe there are some, and maybe for some, it's not as conflictual, but it was the story of my life. 
-hmm. even in an industry, an educational industry where you would think it would not be yeah. warriorship. It has been. You know why? Because of the old stories, we are dragging with us, all of us, men and women, we are dragging archetypes of what it means to be a hero, what it means to be a leader. There's really only one way. And those expectations were created years ago, whether it's the hero journey story, heroism and leadership. I mean, go back and read some of the old leadership Bibles, whether it's Sun Tzu, the art of war, or Machiavelli, the prince. And, and I made a study of the ancient leadership books. Everything has to do with war, warriorship. It's better to be feared than to be loved. Um, never give in, don't make commitments. I was so shocked when I read those books. I was like, what? There's a method to this madness of aggressive leadership? Yes, and we've all bought into it. Women have too. You know, there's a beautiful quote from Nietzsche, the German philosopher, who says, Be careful when fighting monsters, you don't turn into one. Mm. And so, those of us women who want to get into leadership, you know, the urge to be a leader and to have power, it doesn't have to mean you're an egocentric dominator. We all want to make a difference in the world. So, that urge to want to make a difference brings us to the table and then we turn into the very person who isn't making a difference. So how do we do it? Well, I could go into that at length if we have time right now, um, because it's what I have studied over the past 10, 15, 20 years. How do we do power differently? Okay, perfect, because that is the next segment that I want to talk about. Um, we have been talking, that was a perfect segue. It's almost as if we practice this, which we didn't. <laughs> I have Elizabeth Lesser here, and we're talking about um, Cassandra Speaks, When Women Are the Storytellers. Thank you so much.